Good morning. Welcome to Studio Time with Deb. This is the online version. Today we are going to talk more about rings because I'm not done. I've been thinking about them all week. So we're going to talk more about rings. It's not going to be about sizing. I'm done with sizing for the moment. Uh, and I think we came up with some really good answers. I think that chart, like I said, works well for me, for those of you in the Facebook group. Um, there's a chart on the Contente website that gives ring sizes, thicknesses of metal, and I made eight rings, different sizes, different wires, whatever, according to that. And I had fabulous success. Every one of them was sized perfectly. So I'm over that. However, what I was really going to talk about rings, and there were some other questions that people asked, is more generally about rings. Uh, some of you I know sell work. Um, all of you wear work and appreciate other people's work. So this week I spent a lot of time thinking about rings. Plus, I also have 90 bazillion ring blanks now that I need to deal with. So I got to do something with them, right? <laughs> One of the things I was thinking about rings is that it is one of the few forms of jewelry that the wearer sees probably more than the public does. So if you're wearing earrings, right? Somebody says, oh, great earrings. The first thing you do is go, what earrings do I have on, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, well, okay, thanks. Now I know what I'm wearing. But a ring, when you hold your hand up, right? It's me that sees that, not you. You don't normally hold your hand up like that unless it's a fresh engagement ring or something. So a ring is one of those things that's almost more for me than it is for anybody else. Um, in thinking about rings, I separated them into two categories. Um, one is the rings that we wear all the time. And I made that wedding bands and class rings. That's the two that I know of. My daddy wore his class ring up until the day he gave it to um, Elise when she graduated from, um, from vet school from Texas A&M. And that's where he went to school. And so um, he gave it to her, but he wore it every day from the, the, the day he got it until then. Uh, Elise has a class ring. I know some people do. I, I never got a class ring, but I know a lot of people do wear class rings. Wedding bands. Um, I, I guess I'm irreverent or something. I don't know. I have 14 or 20 or I don't know. I have lots of wedding bands and I just wear different ones all the time, just like I wear whatever. But like I said, rings are for me. So I wear whichever one I'm in the mood for. I'm still very married, regardless of whether I have a ring or not. But, uh, <laughs> but um, so that's the ones we wear all the time. So the rings that we're going to talk about today is not those. What we're going to talk about today are the rings that we wear just for fun. And there's lots of rings that we wear just for fun. There's stacking rings, there's flashy rings, there's rings that make a statement, um, there's really big rings. Sometimes they make a statement that says, look how rich I am. Um, sometimes they make a statement that say, um, I, it has a political message, it looks at a stone, it does. Um, and sometimes they are so outrageous that they're almost impossible to wear and that's okay too. Even rings that are almost impossible to wear, I swear I have worn and, um, and enjoyed wearing uh, to gallery openings, to whatever. I think they're kind of fun. So why rings? Well, for one, like I said, I see it regularly. And if I see it regularly, and every time I look down at my hand, it makes me smile or it makes me think, that's pretty cool for a piece of jewelry, right? I like that. So there's also stones that I love that I put on a ring, you know, something um, that I found a, a pebble from a beach that I found somewhere. And every time I look at that, I remember that I picked up that stone with my sister Gay, who died seven years ago. You know, I remember, um, I, I remember that that's a, a, a piece that I that I found in the yard after the kids left it there, a rusty piece of whatever. Um, so rings can be very, very, very personal, right? Something that, that I remember and something that I see regularly on my hand. Uh, rings are also a great way to practice a technique. So because I don't have to make two of them, I can only make one, right? I only need to make one. Um, 
I can practice a technique pretty easily. On a ring, I could practice stone setting. I can practice filigree. I can practice um, an inlay technique. I can practice, I can practice all sorts of things and end up with a really beautiful band to wear that I could wear with something else. I could do with a stacking ring. I could do something else. But it's a relatively easy way to practice a technique. Um, there's not much engineering to it. It basically needs a hole big enough to fit on my finger. So, um, so that makes it kind of fun to deal with. And it's also an easy way to be really playful in the studio. I think one of the things that's missing for a lot of us is we get into the studio and I know that now we have more time, but now it's, it's still difficult to be playful right now at this time. But I think it's important and especially in the studio, it's important. And so it, playful and experimental, I would say. I would say both are really important. So if you can get in there and work with, say you're working with copper or work with nickel or work with something that's not valuable so you're not worried about the money, you're not worried about making it in silver or gold or whatever, and try out some things. Try out some different shapes, some different sizes, some different, um, different ideas about the way things meet. Just give it a shot. And with a ring, it's really simple. The scale is small, you know, it's one piece. Um, there's not a lot of restraints as far as design goes. You can do pretty much anything as long as, like I said, you can put it on a finger, you're pretty much good to go. So that allows you a whole world, that allows you a palette of just about anything that'll fit on your hand. Rings we wear for fun. So these are rings that we, like I said, just wear for fun, that they're, they're um, and I've separated them somewhat. I'll show you somewhat. Stacking rings are first. So we made these in class one semester and these are different ones. Some of these are class one, some of these are other people's. The key for rings that stack, for making rings that stack, is that those rings do need to be pretty much the same size, but the elements that are on top do need to clear the other rings because they go over them. So you can't put something like on the side of it, on the side of one of the bands, unless that band is always going to be on the outside of the stack. So here's some more stacked up. And they can interlock in really fun ways. Like if you look at that, this piece, this solid piece goes through this tube. Those are on two different bands. So the tube is on one band and the solid piece is on a different band and they go through, it goes through. They don't have to meet well. This is one where they don't necessarily, they stand off a little bit. They can be stones. Again, they can stand off a little bit. See how these two don't meet up? And that's fine too. That works. They can also be worn lots and lots of different ways, uh, which is really fun. Like stack them up different directions. Different kinds of wires, a little bit of gold. Open rings. So sizing was an issue. We talked about that last week. And sizing is something that just gives people fits. Although with that chart, it really doesn't have to give you fits. What I did was to put together a grouping of rings that are open. Um, I do not know what this one is. This is all I know. It looks enameled, which if it's enameled, you certainly can't adjust it um because you would crack everything it might not be it might be something else entirely i'm not sure what it is this is one that lee holtzman made and um it's got an opal on one side i think that's a cz on the other but it goes around your finger and comes up on both sides and stays in place that way there you can see how it how it works really simple little open ring with some stamping.
This is a series. Um, this woman's website is really nice. And um, I do not know what that, it looks like copper. I would imagine it's not for the prices she's charging, but maybe it is. This one has a flush set stone in the end and then a piece of ebony wood on the top. Another flush set stone. Notice on the flush set stone, it's got the same metal that's out here. It's got that red metal that's been inserted. Could be red gold, I'm not sure. This is really close up on the finger and it's hard to see. There is a flush set stone right here. A flush set or tube set. This is an open ring, but there's two of them involved. So it looks like it's, it looks like they're not open because it's, they're touching, but really they are. Another open ring. Golden diamonds opened. My guess is this is metal clay, but I think you could do something very similar if you overworked some silver. You'd have to be very careful that you don't overwork it to the point where it's going to crack and break later. I have trouble with metal clay rings. I, I'm hard on jewelry and I tend to crack them and break them. Um, I know some people can wear them fine. I'm not so good at it. Gold and diamonds. Notice on the left hand side, this one, where it comes up over the other finger and it has an allowance for the other finger to wear. So it looks like it's just this piece going over the top, but really it's not. Two stones. That's what that ring looks like, the same, that, that's the same ring, that's this ring. That's what it looks like fabricated. See how playful this is, see how fun this is? The, one of the things that, that if you start experimenting with this and really playing with this, is it'll make you think about uh, pendants and brooches and other things a little bit differently. You'll start thinking about mechanisms, you'll start thinking about the relationship of how things sit, how they work. I don't know if this one is soldered in there or not. It might be, it might not be. It'd be fine either way. These, the same thing. Deb, yeah. on, a ring, on a ring like this or like the last one, would you have to worry about getting water or stuff in between those two layers? Um, over time, it's gonna discolor if it's silver. If it's gold, not so much, um, yeah. yeah. So it kind of depends on what it is. Rings like this are not meant to wear every day. I mean, you're not going to wear them when you shower and do dishes and that kind of thing. That being yeah, I forget said, about that part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That being said, you're probably still, you know, if it's silver, it is over time going to oxidize in there. Um, since this one doesn't have a stone, one thing you can do is to burn off the oxidation and you can do that by heating it up a little bit like to the annealing point and then throwing it in a tumbler or brass brushing it or whatever. Um, so if it stays white in there, you're fine. Uh, you can also intentionally oxidize it so that you're, you're in control of the color. That wasn't done here, but it could be. This is Charities. 
nice textures, huh? This one, it's this one over here that's open. See the opening right here? Multi-finger rings. I thought these were really funny when I was playing with them. So this ring goes on two fingers. This ring goes over two fingers and when it, it's enameled on top, there. And it looks like that when it's being worn. This one is similar, but the pieces are not so flat. They're more cattywampus. So when it's on, it looks like this. That's kind of fun, huh? And how would you size those types of rings? Well, I think it'd be really simple because look, I could take this and move this in or out really easily, right? What holds it on is that this goes on top and these just kind of, kind of go around your fingers. So it'd be really easy to tighten this up or spread it out. Another multi-finger ring, two-finger ring. There it is on. This is a multi-finger ring, two fingers. So this one has the stone on top of one finger and it has this, this on top of the other finger. And neither one match, uh, touches, so this doesn't touch here. So it could all be sized. So this comes around, it's like a giant S. Multi-finger ring. So one's on one finger, one's on the other finger. There's a chain connecting them. I've never worn one like this. I've always seen ones like this. I think it would make me nuts, but I think they're fascinating. That's really unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you Google multi-finger rings, you'll come up with a lot of stuff like this. How's this one, guys? Art rings. So now what I'm going to show you is rings that are, a lot of these are not super, super wearable. They're, however, I wouldn't say that they're not wearable. They are wearable. Um, they're just wearable for special occasions. You're not going to wear these every day. You're not going to wear them around the house. Check out this stone setting right here. Whew. And look at the opportunity here to, to play with setting things, setting this, the, the, so there's a stone on wood here, wood or cork. Look at this setting. Look at this, with a piece of metal or a coin in it. It's hard to tell what it is. Flush setting. So this is an opportunity to play around with all of these different kinds of settings and different kinds of possibilities for rings. What a fun collection. Look at that tension set stone. This ring I've shown you before, there it is on. Somehow this ring speaks to me. I'm not sure why, but it really does. I, I just think this ring is wonderful. I would wear that. This is Rania's. So it's a great opportunity to learn filigree, something like that. You can do it. She's got a pendant here too, but then two rings there. And it's a great way to learn it in a relatively small space. Beautiful rings. Play with stone setting of something really unusual. I think these are Joanna Goldberg's, but I'm not positive, so I didn't label them. Uh, but this again is, this is mica that's being held in place with these long prongs. 
And then on the ring, these pieces, these pieces turn, they flip back and forth. You know, the other thing rings are really fun for is fidgeting. Um, a lot of us fidget with our rings when they're just plain, but when they move or do something, oh my gosh, that's really great to fidget with. This is Monica's. Monica, you want to say anything about it? Um, what do I want to say? <laughs> this one is titled Little Man in the Boat. That's all I got to say. Little Man in the Boat. So tell us, what it's a pearl. What's the um, inlay? Yeah, so that's a wood inlay I got from a little store in Florence that makes these molds these wood things for all decorative sorts of stuff. It's really, I can't even remember the name of the wood. It's really hard and dense. It took me way longer to file that than it did any of the sterling. It looks like ebony, but I wouldn't swear to that. No, it's not, it's browner. It's not as black as ebony. I should uh -huh. find the names I can remember, but um, I had to remake this ring like because I didn't do it right the first time, so. And that's one of the things I'm talking about, about using these as um, technical exercises, as well as making your statement that this is a great way to learn the hollow form and figure out how to do it and how to make it work. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, it was cool. Like the hardest part I had was getting the cylinder inside the, mm. the curved form, because when I curved the form, I just thought, oh, this, the circle goes straight in there. But uh, no, I, no, it, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I was, that was a total exercise in learning all the new things. Well, it's beautiful. I think this is also Joanna Goldberg's, but I'm not sure. Look at those tourmaline crystals. Oh, gorgeous. And look at the settings the way she's chosen to set these things. I, that's fascinating too, and really interesting. All right, how did she, how did she, excuse me, how did she set those tourmaline spines? What well, you... so this one up top has two prongs, one here, one here, they're hidden behind. They go around the back. You can kind of see them wrapping around the back, right? This one, I have no idea. This one again has a prong that comes and wraps around and I imagine there's something back here. This one has a bezel. Okay, no, so no drilling and gluing then? I don't believe so, but I don't know that. Okay. She's kind of not a drilling and gluing kind of girl, but maybe. Love this ring. This is Ruth Casey. She's an Australian um, artist. And the ring is over here. This was done for the Australian equivalent of the Grammys for somebody to wear. And you can imagine somebody going on stage who has a dress to match wearing this feather-like piece that covers your hand. These are powder coated. And talk about playful and talk about fun and talk about a great exercise just to see what you can do and what you can get away with and what works and what doesn't. There's more of them, look at these. They look like kids toys. I'd wear one on every finger. This is a two part ring. It, it's one ring, but when you're wearing it, it looks like two rings, but they're separated. This is a technique, some of you have seen this, where you take the bracelet, you take a band of metal and you squish it down. I know that uh, Carl Stanley does a class with that and other folks do. Um, this guy adapted it to do it with rings. And um, so these are some rings that were squished like that. So again, uh, as a mechanism to try out a technique, to try something. And it's a lot less material, it's a lot less work, it's a lot less time when you do it on a ring than if you do it on a bracelet. So figuring out a technique, figuring out how to do what you want to do on a small scale is a lot easier than 
than doing it on the big scale. And then if you wanted to go to the big scale, great, do it. Deb, how did, do they heat the metal up and then squeeze it? Or how does that, how do they accomplish that? It it's hammer? annealed and then it's squished. And what happens with these, he's rounded the edges over just beautifully. So when I did this, what I did was to, um, there's a lot of different, different ways to do it. But when I did it, what I did was to start with a tube, a fairly thick metal, and then I used dapping punches to flare both sides. Then I took a ball peen hammer basically and I rounded the edge. So I brought the edge. So see how soft these edges are? See how they're brought around? So I rounded all of those edges and then I came in from the top and squished these things. And when you squish them, you can squish them more, you can squish them less. Uh, if you put some dents in the tube, you can make them squish in certain places and not other places. Uh, you really have a lot more control over it than you think you might, but you have to practice with it. Nick you say squish. Nick Sorry. is English, and he trained um, apprenticed under as a silversmith in um, England, and he he goes does all kinds of things. He's um, a member of the guild I'm in, in Washington, Washington Goldsmiths Guild, and he nice. has Sal Bella winner too. Nice. Yeah, these so are beautiful, you say, beautifully done. Deb, when you say squish, do you mean like a hydraulic press or like with a hammer? So hydraulic press is going to be a lot more even. You can see that these are not even. This one is really narrow in the back and really wide in the front. Um, sometimes you can, so the system that um, I think it was Carl Stanley came up with was two PVC pipes, one on the inside, one on the outside that you squish, so you squish the material down. Um, I, when I do it, I normally do it with a hammer, um, but I love fire and hammers. That's kind of my thing. This is another one practicing stone setting, similar to one I showed you before. Another one, a real simple ring, but flush setting. Tension setting. I mean, how easy is it to take a piece of wire, bend it around, and but then you got to do the hard part. You got to figure out where those cuts are, how to make it, how to hold that stone in place. Look at this one holding the stone in place. So this is steel and I think silver rivets. And there you can see how it is. And it's the rivets that hold it in. If he had done a good job on the cutting those, I don't think you'd even need those side plates, although they do make it look really interesting. Okay, let's go back to this. This one is, I love this ring. Um, this one, this stone slides back and forth in this channel. And it's held together by four, these four rivets with the spacing of the tubing to keep it just right so that stone fly, you know, can, can slide back and forth, which it, I think is kind of the ultimate fidget ring. I would sit there all day and just slide that back and forth. Chink, 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 chink. That would be great. Deb, is that Angela Fung from London? I believe so. I was trying to search for her name and I couldn't find it. Because I have a ring in silver. Not exactly like that, but I have a, the stones slide back and forth. In a yeah, channel. yeah. I, I was searching for her name. Hey I Deb, really fun. is that secured by rivets? Yeah, right here. There's a rivet right here. Okay. Four of them. And okay. it's got tubing spacers. Thank you. And what gauge metal do you think that ring was? Well, the sidewalls are pretty heavy. I would say probably 18. You'd want something relatively substantial. The spacing obviously is critical, right? And the rivets look to be countersunk. So again, for countersunk rivets, you'd want 18 or 16 even, but I think that's 18. Uh, practicing forging, getting those tapers really beautiful. Practicing forging, doing all kinds of things. Practicing dapping and drilling and just putting them together in really fun ways. For those of you who are interested in selling, and I had several people ask me questions about selling rings. So Sizing is always an issue because no matter what the ring the person loves, they're going to love the one that doesn't fit them. Um, I don't know how that works. It just does. One answer is to have a bazillion rings like this um, that they can just try on different ones until they find one that they like. 
Um, Elise, our, our daughter, she's, she was really funny. She wanted uh, uh, one of the carved rings that I make and I asked her what size and she said, mom, make it any size you want. She said that as long as it's within, you know, some sort of normal range, I'll find a finger that it fits on. So I think if somebody wants it bad enough, they'll find a finger that it fits on. If you're selling rings, one of the things that you need to decide is if you are willing to size rings or not, if you're willing to change the size on it. And if you're not willing to change the size, that's fine. And you can always tell people that you could build another one. It won't be exactly the same, but it'll be similar. This is a really pretty gold and steel, I believe. These are huge honking metal. I don't believe they're hollow. Like this one, not hollow. One thing you do have to be careful of, especially if you're selling rings, um, is the width. So if you want something that you're going to wear on a more regular basis, having a really wide ring can be um, a problem, can be problematic because water gets under there, things get under there. If you're going to, if it's a real specialty ring that you're only going to wear occasionally and for a short period of time, it doesn't matter so much. But if it's something that, that would potentially be worn on a regular basis, I would watch the width. One of the things you can do, this one, because it's got openings here and here and here and here, it's gonna let your finger breathe and move a little bit better than one that's absolutely solid in the same width. It was, Deb, was that one piece of wire there? Or is yep, it multiple? that's one piece of wire. Wow. Deb? Yeah. In, in this ring, and Monica's also, how does the pearl stay in place? Traditionally, pearls are pegged. We'd have to ask Monica about hers, but traditionally they're pegged. And so what you do is that you, um, you solder on or drill in a place for, usually it's 20 gauge. And traditionally, the, if, if, when it's in gold, they are threaded. And what the threading does is that it allows the glue to hold on to something. If you just have a solid peg, and that's slick wire and you glue a pearl on that, over time what happens is that the glue and the slick wire and whatnot change um, temperatures and change size and whatnot enough that, that it'll tend to come loose. The, th there's several things you can do instead of threading the wire. You can also just take it and file some notches in it. You can also take a pair of round nose pliers and kind of squish it a little bit back and forth but something to give the glue some, something to hold on to, and then they're glued in place. Uh, I recommend a good, clear epoxy. Thank you. This would be a great solder exercise. That is clean soldering, guys. Love these. I'd like to wear like three of these at once. So this is from a rings exhibit in Munich back in 2015. And you can kind of get a sense of just how, how different they can be. I think this one is really clever. Two drilled holes, holes saw it out and then bend the, the shank back of a really special coin.
This one is fold formed. This one has the stone set upside down, which is kind of fun. Deb, can you go back two slides to this flush setting one, that one? Or I guess it's not flush setting. So obviously that's heat textured, right? I don't think so. I think these are cast and it was just cast with a really rough texture. That's my guess. You could do because something similar by heat texturing. You could also do something similar by just using a really nasty hammer and beating on the wire. I like that, it's pretty. Yeah, I like those too. This one is steel and gold and silver, I believe. There's the side view of it. These are the three rings I made for Elise that I sent her. So she wears the, these guys, these carved ones all the time. And she is harder on rings than I am. So what happens is that she wears the um, texture off on silver. I got to make her one in gold that she can't wear it off. She wears it off and then she breaks them and then she sends them back and then I make her another one. Cynthia, I'd made these. These are wedding bands. I think these are just stunningly beautiful. They'd be gorgeous on your finger. Tom McCarthy made this. It was a commission piece. Uh, apparently somebody's grandmother's diamond. And they wanted to wear it. So there you go. This is stainless steel inlaid into silver. What do you, or how, what do you mean inlaid into silver? So the outside part is stainless steel and the inside the part? The lines, the lines are stainless steel. See these gray oh. lines? Okay. That's stainless steel. Oh, okay. So Deb, how do you pound the stainless steel without smushing the heck out of the silver? Um, you do kind of smush the silver. So basically you carve the line into the um, silver first, right? Right. So you probably use a separating disc or whatever, carve a good deep line, get a, um, and then ideally, D, what you want to do is that you want to undercut that. So ideally, what you do is that you, you, you can either do it with a graver, or you can do it with a separating disc if you're careful, since they're straight lines, is that you turn the separating disc just a little, little bit, keep it in the same place on the top, but underneath, you're making the underneath wider. And then you put a piece in there and hammer it. And what happens is that the bottom should spread out and that's what holds that line in place. Now, that being said, um, that is not easy to do with stainless because the metal that you're pounding in is harder than the metal that you're pounding it right. into. Um, another way to do this might be to cut open a bigger channel than what you really want and, um, and then have your stainless cut at a trapezoid so that it's smaller on the top and larger on the bottom. And the bottom is the size of the channel and you put it in and then you hammer over the excess silver. I don't know how he made this one. Again, you know, it's a ring and it's simple. It would be really easy to try it. Um, and that's one of those things in looking at this that you could, you know, you take a piece of half round wire and give it a shot, see what it'll do. I can see, see on these, that this stainless, each one of these stainless ones go in quite a ways, not all the way down, but they go in quite a ways. They don't look bigger to me on the bottom than the top, but that doesn't mean they aren't. This is an interesting one. So it's tree bark with wood and moss. And again, it's that squished ring kind of I like this one. So one thing you can do with rings is design with uh, index cards. I mean, wouldn't that be fun to design with index cards? I love how that's put together. Lee Holtzman made this one. 
And it's one of the thumbprint rings, but it's used as reticulation. These, you can practice your tube setting. You can practice the soldering of something here in between. These are easy to size because you just make them smaller than you really want them and then um, find the stone that fits in there <laughs> or cut them down some or whatever. Deb, yeah. on that last one, are they only soldered on one side or are they soldered on both sides? Of the, of both the sides, tube? both sides. Deb, how do you how do you do that? I I've tried to do that with a with a shank, you know, meeting on either side of a bezel, and I, I've not been able to do it successfully. So you mean as far as setting up for the soldering, is that the problem? Right. Yeah. Right. So you're going to do it upside down. What you're going to do is to use a very soft ah. um, material, fire brick or a magnesia brick or um, something very very soft. You can also use uh, if you're careful. Uh, one of the solder, they call it solder clay. You have to mix it up. It's kind of like plaster of Paris. Okay. The problem with solder clay on this one is I think it would keep the ring shank too cold to solder well. But okay. I normally just do a fire brick and I flip the thing upside down and press the setting into the fire brick uh, right. most of the way and then I'll set my ring and then I'll solder from the back. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. This is steel and gold. This is what I mean too by a ring. You're not going to wear this every day, but how fun to look down and see that. Practice and fun with stone setting. These are fun. I would have that one off my finger and be flipping those things around something fierce. They're just riveted? In one place. So they've got to all swing. How fun is that? These are just wraparounds. Wraparounds make great ones because they're also, um, you know, they're super easy. Sizing is super easy and they're really elegant. You could have it soldered on one end, this one on the left, because it's got the space up here. If it was soldered on this far end, this end can still slip some. You can still have some sizing in there. Another one across the top of the hands. All right. So the next little set that I want to show you real fast is um, these are ones that are done as um, sets, as series. So it's, for those of you who want to sell, doing a series of rings, doing a set of rings, something like that, something with a theme uh, is something that really sucks people in. Uh, and sometimes they'll want several rings. So William White did this and he was influenced by astrology, but these have to do, I'm going to show them to you relatively fast. These have to do with the planets and the, and he did it. He has a whole thing about which stones he used and why and what the planet and how many moons and what it looks like. And so it's kind of fun. People want a story. And you can see the similarity, but you can also see the differences, right? That one's Saturn, obviously. This is Richard Sally, and this is a poison ring. So you can also do rings that um, make a statement, which I think a poison ring really makes a statement. Uh, it opens up here. And there you can keep your poison or something else. More practicing setting. This is Robert Lopez.
This is Marnie Ryan, and she posted some time ago about how she does rings. She does really high-end rings and has made a good living selling predominantly rings. She sells other things too, but she does the rings. And the, this is her, she makes a bazillion bands and has a bazillion stones, and then she matches them up. So this is her beginning to match them up. You can see there's a stone inside each ring, sometimes two stones. And so she's matching them up so that she can continue working on them. Here they are kind of match a, a different view. Here they are made up. And there's a view of finished ones. These are bracelets, although they could be rings and done similarly. I just I threw them in because I thought the technique was really interesting and would make beautiful stacking rings. Notice that they go from really large to really small. So when you're selling, um, this is something that's important. You want a bracelet here that'll fit me and you want a bracelet over here that will fit, I'm not sure who, somebody really little. So this next one is Andy Cooperman series that he posted recently. These are stainless and they are playful. They're rings predominantly. He did have some earrings in here too but he's just bending the stainless wire around and then, and then soldering them with the, um, the uh, PUK solder or PUK welder. So he's welding the end of the stainless. And you can see how they fit, but you see how they do the series. So there's something about playing with a series like this. This is multiple ones together. There's something about playing with a series that makes that's really fun. And it'll make you think about what works and what doesn't work and how far you can push this and doing some, he's done some forging on this. This one has gold and a little diamond on it. Again, a little diamond. See what fun formed, how fun to play. So the last thing I wanna go over with you is Danica Designs uh, Gallery is having a battle of the rings. It started June 1st. Uh, Ann Wolf contributed one, she's got one in there. And basically it's a ring smackdown. So they're doing the, putting them head to head, having people vote. Um, but so, And I've taken some screenshots, just a few. But if you go over there, the rings are wonderful. They're outrageous. Some of them are really, they're just fun. You ought to go see it. It's Danica Designs Gallery or danicadesignstudio.com. We'll find it. So this is one and it has blades and a spinner. And again, it's open. Notice the open. This is another one. Anne, are you here with us? Yep, yep, I'm here and Amy's here too. Hi. Hi, Anne, talk about your ring. Oh, sure. Um, well, it was, um, I knew it had to be Mokume, that was the first thing. Um, and then I wanted it to be something about um, the times that we're in these days, feeling sort of unsettled and off balance. So. Um, I actually started making it and was thinking about a, a boat on a dock with all the, the, the rough wood underneath the pipe, like the wooden pilings. And so I made the pilings part and it's a square, it's a, or a trapezoid, I should say. And then I was going to solder the boat on symmetrically on top. And then I did that and I, I didn't solder it. I just set it up and I realized that the symmetry of it just killed it. So um, I actually just angled it and let it sort of slip off a little bit. And set it and, and discovered a spot where I, I could solder it that it was stable, but it at a diagonal. So um, I like the way it turned out because it's uh, uh, it looks a little unsettled. It's quite sturdy to wear, 
um, but the boat is a little bit of an angle on your hand and it also stands freely. So I like rings that can be a, their own little sculpture that, that, mm, that don't just lie flat when they're off the hand. So it does um, make a, it does stand up on its own. Nice. Yeah, you can see, um, see her ring there. It's really a nice piece. You, you guys ought to take a look. That's the end of my slideshow. I have some other things that I want to uh, show you also. And Anne, I want to get you back in just a little bit to talk about your class tonight. Sure. Um, so the other reason for doing collections, back, the other reason for doing collections of things is that it's an intensive way to play. So you know that when you do something and you do it once, um, when you're learning to hit a baseball and you try and you try and you try and you do it once, if you walk away after that once that you had success, you learned and you learned something, but not as much as if you keep doing it and keep doing it until you do it lots of times in a row. And that's one of the things that, that doing collections can, can do for you. So it's not only about presentation, it's also about um, the way that we learn and the way that we study things. You'll understand it much more in depth. It also gives you an opportunity to play. You know, you don't want to do the, the same thing over and over. So it tends to make you push your design a little bit more, which is, which can be really fun. Years and years ago, I played around with, what can I get away with for rings? What can I do? How, how, how misshapen can I do this? I had one that was perfectly square. It didn't go on. I put it on a ring mandrel and two edges bulged out and two of them bulged in. Uh, which turned out really cool. And I have no idea what happened to that ring, but I'm going to make another one because I really liked it. This ring is very wearable. This is very wearable. Sometimes it goes over to the side. I'd love a series of three or four of these in different colors of gold because they're, they're going to turn on each other. It should look really cool. This one is a uh, flat wire, really thin, but curved in the flat direction. Um, which is not as hard to do as you might think it is. So that's kind of a fun thing to learn and play with for rings. I wanted to show you this. This again, these are kind of for hollow forms. Um, they were, they're, they're just samples to see what works and what doesn't work on your finger. So I can put this on my finger and I can say, is this gonna work? Is this something that I can wear on my hand? Is this too wide here and needs to get cut down to be wearable? Am I even worried about it being wearable? But if I am worried about it being wearable, this is a good answer. You know, try it out, see what works, see what I can get away with, see what I can do. So these are just, um, and I wanted to show you this anyway. These are copper and nickel and they're just patterns. And the nice thing about that is that when I find one that I really like and I've finally worked to make it symmetrical, if that's what I want, or I've made it exactly the shape I want it to be. Now, this is easy for me to repeat, right? This is easy for me to go in here and make that outside pattern. I can take that wire, I can bend it around this pattern. Um, so I've got patterns that I like to deal with. Also, if I really like the shape, say I really like the shape, there's no reason I can't just use the outside shape or the outside shape to do earrings or to do something else. So pattern making directly in the metal is something I highly recommend. I want to show you one more exercise. That's these guys. So playing in my studio one day, I decided that what I would do is, this is half round wire, but I think I ran it through the mill to flatten it. And then you can see there's some scoring and bending involved. There's just some bending. There's some... But again, it's an exercise to see what's wearable, what's not, what fits my finger well, how can I make this wire, I, like this one come around and twist. Um, this one, is this wearable? Yes, is this wearable? It's just an exercise, it's just playing with it. This would make a great, um, if it's a little bit thicker, would make a great tension setting. This one could too, this one could too. This one could, but it's a great way to play in your studio. And the last thing that I want to show you is some of these. So 
Here's these rings. These are tension set. This is eight gauge sterling silver. And the stone is held in just by tension. I think in sterling, it can't be a lot thinner than that. I think if it's a lot thinner than that, then you, you don't have, and even this in sterling is iffy. Um, but you don't wear these rings all the time. But I love having two of them because I wear them together sometimes. So they look like that. Um, this is a ring that Connie Hall made that I love and I love wearing. And it's a really big ring. It's a big honking ring with a beach pebble in it. This is one I made because this piece, the copper here, was on my bench and it was left over from something else. And I really loved it. I thought it was just really gorgeous. And so all I did was to take it and solder it onto a ring band. But I have to say that I think it's gorgeous to wear. It's easy to wear. I love it. And how fun to be able to play with tacking these and figuring out how it works and how it doesn't and how the pieces go together. Okay, this, these are pieces I made for earrings. And it just so happens, they're heat textured, but it just so happens that they're fused together that if I put them together like this, they make a great stacking ring. Look at this, where the ends show, and it's relatively comfortable to wear. So that's a fun piece. The last one I have to show you, I kind of did as a dare. Um, I kind of wanted to know how big rings could be and still be wearable. So I made these three rings and they're humongous, right? You can see they're humongous. Here's the story though, they go together. You're, these are stacking rings. <laughs> I know they don't look like it, but they are. So if you look at this, see how this one curves this way, this one curves there, and this one is straight. So what happens is this stacks on here like that this one stacks on here like that. And then when I put them all together and put them on, they look like that. All on one finger. Deb, can I possibly see that one where you had the last one you did, the fused metal? The fused together? ones? Yeah for the stacking. I want to take a screenshot of that. I like those. So these, like I said, I made them for earrings. They look like this. I just took round wire. This looks like 12 gauge to me. And I just laid them down and I fused them. So I was not worried about ring size or anything else. It just so happens that they're relatively my ring size. One of them's a little big, one of them's a little small, but they work. But when I take them and stack them up, the ends, see the ends of the wire meet really funny. And so I was stacking them up to play with them the other day and I put them on my finger. And I really like the look. Yes, I like them too. I like that idea. Yeah. All right. So that is the end of my ring segment for today. I may not be done with this yet. We'll see. But <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about rings. And so now you have some of my other thoughts on rings. Um, are there any questions? Deb, have you found any um, advantage to, um, or not advantage, but I saw how you made the rings for your huge, humongous ring, kind of square-ish. Um, I like really top-heavy rings. Have you found the best shape to keep rings from, like, tipping? Yeah, heavy rings are going to tip. There's several things you can do. Making them square helps a little bit. Uh, putting balls on the inside, you put them right there and right there, either balls or wires on the inside of the ring. Uh, also helps it stay upright. 
a lot of times what people will do is something that that covers like if this if the ring is going to be here let me put one ring on this one this one is is too big for me and you can see it flops over see how it flops over if i put something on there though that would be that would basically extend this a little bit so it hits my fingers right it's not mm -hmm. going to flop as much the square helps um you can see a square band trapezoid band helps uh really heavy rings are going to fall over okay so when you say trapezoid meaning like they call it finger shape it's not so rather than being being equal on all sides it's smaller on one side than the other and then the other two curve in a little okay. bit okay oh that makes sense so it that it would mandrel. yeah mm -hmm. okay i'll check into that thank you mm -hmm. deb you were talking about your uh, uh how do you know what a good clear epoxy would be well, glues these days are really darn good. I mean, we've got, we've got a lot of really good choices. We didn't used to, but we sure do now. Um, I, on the package, it'll say dries clear. That's important. Uh, Devcon is a good brand. Um, who else? I mean, any good two-part epoxy, I would just, you know, hardware store epoxy is fine. 330 is the one that, um, epoxy 330 is the one that jewelers traditionally use. Um, and it, that's a good one also. And thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, this version of Studio Time with Deb, the online version, will be up on YouTube shortly. And I'll see you next week. Bye, guys. <laughs>